Ranch Hand for Auction Written by Kimberly Cray Narrated by Morgana Morningside Dedication To Mom and Dad For the many seasons spent processing the grapes A labor of love indeed Chapter 1 Meg's mom had always said that for a right-brained girl Meg had quite a lot of left brain in her The right allowed her to create paintings that hung on walls throughout the country. The left is what got her paintings on those walls, her business sense. So which side was best put to use when trying to get a man to commit? A man she'd been dating for three solid years. That dilemma brushed over her mind in a painter's stroke, back and forth and over again as sense from the country fair wafted through the air. You want that one? He looks pretty good, doesn't he? Meg's dad had said the same thing about every ranch hand who'd been up for auction. She pulled her gaze from the sunny view of potato sack races on the grassy field and shifted it back to the shaded stage a good 20 feet before her. The metal picnic benches weren't getting any softer, and neither was her father's resolve. Billy Barnhart, proudest rancher in the state of Montana, patted the ranch hand on the back. Travis here is built like a mule, will work like an ox, and won't give you a word of grumbling. You provide his stand, he'll provide the work. Put these dollars to good use and give Travis a fair starting bid of $100. Do I hear 100 for an entire week of labor? Her eyes ran over the guy's bulky form. No, don't get him. We don't need anyone that big. We're making grape juice, not building a winery. It was true. But secretly Meg was hoping they'd run out of ranch hands before her father could bid on one at all. One hundred, came a voice from behind. A woman's voice. Meg spun around to see Mrs. Winstrom standing tall, one hand in the air, the other at her mouth where she bit at the tips of her nails. I wonder what she wants with him, Meg said. Probably wants help removing the shrubs on that hillside of her property. Her husband passed away a couple years back. Did you know that? Meg sighed, a mean ache sinking into her chest. No. A lot had happened since she'd left for college, hadn't it? Was it before Mom died or after? Her dad glanced at her, the blue-green of his eyes working to hide his surprise. Meg was surprised herself with as easy as the question had slipped out. He licked his lips, set his gaze back on the stage. After. She stifled the next question that arose, the how-did-he-die question. What difference did it make? Sometimes people died before their time. Happened with Mom. Turns out it happened with Mr. Winstrom, too. Hope Celia gets this one, her dad mumbled. The comment made Meg realize that a bidding war was at hand, the bids falling between Celia Winstrom and old John Tucker. Meg gave her dad a questioning glance. Tucker already scored two ranch hands, he said, and I'm sure he plans to work the kids near to death. Three hundred and fifty, hollered Tucker, his face mad and red. All eyes fell back to Celia, a hush following over the crowd. The lovely woman gave the subtle shake of her head. Her gaze dropped. Three fifty going once, three fifty going twice. Billy lifted his gavel. Four hundred. Meg's eyes widened as she turned to the bidder. Her dad. What are you doing? she hissed. Four hundred, Billy exclaimed. Our highest bid yet do I hear four fifty. Tucker threw her dad a mean glare, but his lips stayed pinned. Billy started the countdown, going once and then twice. When no one piped up with a new bid, the gavel struck down. Sold to Thomas Bolton for four hundred dollars. Her dad tilted his head toward Meg. I'll let Celia have him for her last bid and price and pay the difference, he said in a lowered voice. Can't let John Tucker get the best of her like that. Her dad went on, grumbling things under his breath as the auction continued. Things like, what kind of man does that to a widow anyway? And, stupid jackass drifting on the barbecue-scented breeze. Meg hid a smile. Her parents might have raised her in the country among ranchers and farmers alike. 
but they had a whole lot of city in them, too. Her father, one of the largest real estate brokers in the state, valued the peace and quiet, but he valued her mother's wishes even more. And oh, how Meg's mom had loved the country. Her thoughts were interrupted when her dad gave her a nudge. That's our guy. Meg's eyes darted to the stage once more. She meant to glance over the tall figure as a whole, the way she had the rest of them. But her gaze got stuck on this one's face. His eyes, to be exact. Deep, brown, delicious, and aimed right at her. Meg's heart kicked into a rapid, hopping pace, as if it had joined the sack races on the field. This guy didn't look like the other fresh-out-of-their-teens ranch hands. He looked like a man. A melcher heart hero of a western drama by day, wrangler of twenty-ton cattle by night man. Tall, muscled, and lean. A stream of catcalls came from a huddle of rowdy women toward the front, but the cowboy's gaze stayed locked on her. He eased into a slow grin, the tug at one corner of his lips higher than the other. A devastating dimple sunk deep into his cheek. Yes, she blurted out. Bid on him. Sure, Meg had been entirely against this whole auction thing moments ago, and yeah, she was as close to a committed relationship as one could get, but perhaps what Dad said about having someone help her process the grapes was true. She couldn't do it all on her own. And it'd be a shame to let the fruit simply rot on the vines like it had since Mom died. One thing I might add about Jake here, Billy Barnhart said, is that he's the very ranch hand who started this whole trend the guys donated in half of their weekly wages to our charitable cause. I also might add that Jake won't be in the auction next year, as he'll be running a ranch of his own by then. Billy bumped him with his elbow. Isn't that right? Jake, as he'd been called, allowed for a modest nod. If Meg didn't know better, she'd say there was moisture in Billy's eyes. A hint of redness, too. He liked this one. Was more attached to him than the others. Billy sniffed. <laughs> Let's start the bidding on this fine man, shall we? One fifty, her dad hollered. Meg's eyes went wide. It was the highest starting bid yet. Tucker had already snagged a third ranch hand. But there he went, shooting his beefy arm in the air once more. Two hundred. Two fifty, came one of the ladies in the catcalling crowd. A skinny brunette among them threw Meg a nasty glare. Three, Tucker hollered with a nod. Meg nudged her dad in the arm. Four, say four. Three fifty, her dad shouted. We've got three fifty, Billy said proudly. Do I hear four? Meg's racing heart was going for first place. Pulling from every reserve, thumping harder and faster to the point that it hurt. Remember, folks, Billy said, these guys aren't just for hard labor. No, sir. Hand over an apron and put them to work making preserves or bottling peaches. Jake here never has shot away from the kitchen, I can tell you that. As if on demand, the ridiculously handsome ranch hand lifted his shoulders, poised his arms before him, and began a display of charades stirring while holding some imaginary bowl. The crowd laughed and cheered in response. Jake's smile grew. Meg's heart nearly collapsed. If she was a mix of right and left brained, this guy was a mix of his own. A blend of wholesome and mischievous all at once. That innocent dimple in his cheek, complemented by the brazen lift of his brow. Four hundred! It was that group of ogling women again. Four fifty, Tucker said, his face turning impossibly redder. It's getting a little rich for my blood, her dad said. Meg gasped. Dad, you have more money than all of them. Yeah, but it's just grape juice. We could buy some and save ourselves all the... Five! Five hundred! It was a new voice. A voice that seemed to take everyone off guard. Even Meg. Heads turned, necks craned, eyeballs bulged, and Meg gulped, knowing it was too late to swallow the bid that had just escaped her lips. Five hundred dollars from the lovely Meg Bolton, Billy said with a wink. Good to see you back in town, doll. A rash of heat broke over Meg's face. She was certain it was redder than Tucker's. 
She focused on the difficult task of keeping her gaze off the handsome cowboy she just bit on while the countdown began. Five hundred going once, going twice, and sold to the lovely Miss Bolton. The other ranch hands made sounds of oohs, ahs, hollers, and hoots. One reached out to catch a fist bump. Jake, Billy said, looks like you're one lucky man. Chapter 2 Jake looked into a pair of sad brown eyes. Don't look at me like that bear, he said to the dog, running both hands along the animal's soft head. You know Miss Johnson will be over to care for you. Besides, with as much as I'm gone, I'm sure you're starting to like her more than me, aren't you? When Bear simply wagged his tail, Jake patted his head and came to a stand. He hoisted his duffel bag onto one shoulder and looked at the empty home, a bit of melancholy coming over him. It wasn't that he was unhappy with his place in life, hell, he'd chosen it, but Jake wanted more. He wanted a woman by his side, someone to share his quiet evenings with when the workday was through, perhaps have a few little ones down the road, a pair who'd make those evenings not so quiet after all. Sure, he had his life set out for him, owner of a rental property by his mid-twenties, a ranch that would be his in less than a year. But it was time to settle down and get started with the rest of his life. An image of the lovely Meg Bolton, his bitter at the fair, seeped into his mind. She seemed different from the women in Jake's past. Different in the best of ways. And he'd be damned if there hadn't been some sort of spark between them as they locked eyes across the crowd. His belly warmed at the memory of that day even if it was two whole months ago. Jake gave in to a grin as he locked up. He'd been looking forward to this week since that very day, and now it was here. At prior auction jobs, he'd had plenty of interesting encounters, some he'd shared with the guys while hovered round the bonfire on late summer nights. But as he climbed into his truck, turned over the key, and eased out of his driveway, one thing was sure. This week, with the presence of the lovely Meg Bolton, was sure to top them all. Meg tightened her grip on the steering wheel as she approached Maple Street, her mind spinning faster than the fall leaves whirling in the breeze. Wait, she said, shifting the phone from one hand to the other. You're not home yet? Didn't you say the guy would be there shortly after me? Yes, her dad said. He'll be there in less than 20 minutes. And you're not going to be home for another two hours? The lengthy pause told Meg she wasn't going to like his reply. Might be longer, Meg. You know I'll be working nearly the whole time he's here. I don't see why tonight is any different. She covered a groan. Wasn't it obvious? We haven't even met, Dad. It's awkward. Especially since I'm the one who... Who bit on the guy yourself? <laughs> he chuckled. And it's a good thing you did, too. Who knew that most of the other hands would have already left town by now? Meg appreciated her dad's attempt to shift the focus. The truth was, the other hired hands had taken their leave, going back to school or other seasonal work. Billy had said the bidders could name the week they needed help, assuming no one would have a demand outside of the summer months. He'd been wrong. Meg and her father had only one purpose. Process the Concord grapes for juice the way Mom always had. That couldn't be done until fall. Just let the guy inside show him to his room and the two of you can pick a few bushels before it gets dark. I should be home in time to join you for dinner. Dinner? The word made her panic. What food do you have, Dad? She hadn't been there in over a month. Who knew what kind of things he had lurking in that fridge? I've got a few salmon fillets in the freezer, some potatoes to bake. Should be good enough. Meg couldn't believe she was doing this. Could not believe it. All right, she finally said, dragging out the word. He chuckled. All right, see you tonight. As the line went dead, Meg approached her house. She guessed it was still her house. She may have an apartment back in Denver close to the university she'd earned her bachelor's from, but this would always be home to her. The sun had just begun its slow dip toward the horizon, promising one of Meg's favorite kinds of sunsets, the kind that mixed warm and cool tones in one gradual shift. 
Already the crimson stretch along the horizon faded into hues of pink, lavender, and eventually the light blue of the sky. The warm glow over her home made Meg think back on the day she'd painted her mom sitting peacefully in the patio swing on the front porch. Dad put the painting in a frame. Meg had been only 14 at the time. Who'd have thought that just six years later, Mom would be gone? The thought stung. It had been two years since she'd passed. But sometimes, when Meg thought of it, she had to convince herself that it had actually happened. Mom really had died. She wouldn't put her arms around her ever again. At least not in this lifetime. A stream of silent tears slipped down her cheeks. No, Meg. Don't get caught up in that now. You'll make a mess of yourself. With fresh resolve, she put the car in park, grabbed her bags, and dashed up the stairs. She still had to toss her things in her room, freshen up at the mirror, and, oh yeah, somehow face the fact that her life had become one giant dead end, something she hadn't been able to face during her eight-hour drive. Three years. She'd been with Michael for three years now, and still he wouldn't commit. What was wrong with her that she still wanted to be with a guy who didn't mind if she dated other people? Her bags hit the bed with a plop. She sped toward the mirror, touched up her makeup, and brushed through the strawberry blonde strands of her hair as a question came to mind. Just who was she trying to impress? Some ranch hand? She scoffed. Meg may have felt some serious butterflies when he'd caught her gaze months ago, but they were long gone. Fleeting, really. Yet even as that thought ran through her mind, her body proved it a lie. A fluttery flash in her chest, a dose of warmth to her cheeks. She didn't even know the guy, and already parts of her were misbehaving at the memory of him. Jake, she reminded herself. His name was Jake. She took a step back from the mirror, flicked off the light so the sun could stream through the windows, and fought to hold back a satisfied grin. This was hands down the most flattering lighting there was, and Jake would see her in it. Meg shook her head, insulted by her own musings. It was simply her way of getting even with Michael. Besides, the artist in her would never stop thinking about lighting and what it does for a person's skin. Her phone let out a familiar ding, reminding her of the text she'd missed while driving. The press of a few keys showed they were from Shayna, a.k.a. fiancé to Michael's best friend. Meg skipped straight to her very last text. Did you make it there all right? Don't make me call the police in that little town of yours and make them gallop on over to your place. Meg laughed. Shayna liked to think Meg's hometown was like that of an old western. Sorry. Please don't summon the county sheriff. He's been hunting down a gunman who shot out the saloon and robbed the mercantile. No, really, I made it just fine. The cowboy should be here any minute. Shayna's reply came in seconds. Oh, joy. Be sure and do a do -si do square dance thing for me. And watch out for those cow patties, you hear? Meg laughed. Will do, darling. Have a great week. Tell Michael not to miss me too much. She pushed send, rethinking the final comment. Inwardly, Meg doubted he'd miss her at all. Michael wasn't one for texting and phone calls. He preferred being together, which didn't happen often due to his busy schedule of school and work. A knock came at the front door, and Meg's heart sped into a crazed beat. She adjusted her top on the way down the hall and swooped one last hand through her hair. While rounding the corner, she realized she hadn't closed the front door behind her, just the screen. On the other side of the glass stood a specimen even more attractive than she recalled. Holy, holy. More heart pumps happened as she hurried through the room, a bit of remorse creeping in at not having a moment to compose herself behind the heavy oak door. Hi. The word sounded short and incomplete, like someone snipped it off with a pair of shears. Jake tipped his hat, gave her a nod. Howdy. Deep masculinity. That was the sound of his voice. Rich and low and yummy, yum, yum. The stubborn brass handle fought against her as she tried to open it, jamming as it often did. 
her face filled with warmth. Sorry, this door hates me. She bonked it with the side of her fist. The cowboy chuckled under his breath in that deep tenor. I can see why. At last, the stupid lever clicked into place, allowing her to push open the screen door. Sorry, she said again. Come on in. He gave her another nod and stepped inside. A spicy, masculine scent wafted through the air in his wake. She sucked in a deep breath of it while her gaze wandered over the exposed part of his forearm, appreciating the muscled contours there. Where should I, uh... He spun full circle in the front room, a slow turn as he eyed the art on the wall. A beat of panic rushed through her as he lingered on the painting she'd done of her mom. Downstairs, she blurted. I'll show you. Jake trailed after her through the kitchen, the dining room, and finally down the stairwell. How many people do you have in your family? He asked from behind. Since my mom died, it's just me, my dad, and my older brother. He's married, though, and has two kids. They live a few hours away. She led him to the spare bedroom, flicked on the light, and sniffed at the stale air wishing she'd thought to bring down an air freshener. So now it's just you and your dad here. He shrugged the duffel bag strap off his shoulder and stepped into the room. Actually, I moved out after high school. I went to an art school in Denver. Graduated in the spring, but just haven't gotten myself to fully move back, I guess. He dropped his bag on the bed. So your dad's here by himself most of the time. Her shoulders slumped. Yeah, sadly he is. Though he works enough that I'm, I'm not sure he minds too much. I see. Well... Jake rubbed his palms over his jeans, and there went that dimple, the one she'd forgotten about until that moment. The sight caused a trace of heat to zing through her chest. Where should we start? he asked. Start? Start what? With the large bed behind him and that hint of seduction in his eyes, she'd forgotten her own name. Start? she repeated. Yes. Out back, I'll show you. According to her grandmother, there were two kinds of trouble to get into. The kind you regret, and the kind you don't. Meg could tell that the days ahead, spent with the woman-melting man at her heels, could be trouble indeed. She only wondered which kind it might be. Chapter 3 The rich, tangy smell of Concord grapes filled the evening air as Jake followed Meg into the backyard. She kept a few paces in front of him, casting glances toward his feet over one shoulder. Seems she planned to get right to work, and that suited him just fine. They'd paid a whole lot of money for his assistance, and he'd make it worth their while. He felt bad for playing dumb where her family situation was concerned. The truth was, Jake had done his research and knew darn well Meg lived in Denver, that she was coming back for this very reason. A quiet part of him hoped the two would hit it off, that she might want to extend her stay. A work table stood next to a freshly painted shed, large picking baskets stacked on its surface. Meg pulled the top one from the stack and handed it over before securing one of her own. She tugged open a rickety drawer next, removed two pairs of pruners, and passed one of those along too. Jake managed to catch her eye as she did. Thanks, he grinned enjoying the way her fair complexion showed the slightest blush, a blush that matched the light pink top she wore. His eyes drifted to the neck of that top, one side dangerously close to slipping off her shoulder. Stop, Jake. He shouldn't be ogling this woman. Her father had paid for him to be there, and it was Jake's job to be professional. Besides, he'd changed his womanizing ways. If he were going to pursue another woman... He'd go about it in the proper order. No more jumping the gun. This way, she said, breaking into his thoughts. I'll show you how to pick. Weathered logs created a fence that bordered the massive backyard. Each section covered with twisting vines and huge green leaves. Meg set her basket at the south end of the property and hunched low to the ground. Jake did the same, hunching down beside her. The grapes are mostly hidden beneath the leaves, she explained. You'll want to get into each section here and lift them up with your arm. 
See how many there are? He leaned down, having to hunch lower than her due to his height. And there they were. Clusters of deep purple among the green. Their aroma growing stronger even still. Meg cradled the base of a bunch with one delicate-looking hand and slid the edge of her pruners along the stem. Make sure you have each cluster supported before you cut the stem. With a quick snip, the cluster dropped into her palm. And then you just place them in here. If you look further up to check under each leaf, you'll find several bunches per vine. See those up there? She pointed to a couple before lifting a new patch. And all those there? Jake nodded. Yeah, there are quite a few, aren't there? Meg leaned back to eye the yard. I'd say from post to post, you should come close to fill in your basket. At least that's how I remember it. Jake took a rough count of the posts lining the property. That's a whole lot of grapes. Looks like we've got our work cut out for us. She giggled, a cute little sound. <laughs> you could say that. Boy, did this woman stir at something low in his belly. One moment she was poised, proper, and rather aloof. The next she was blushing and eyeing him with a flirtatious grin. Well then, he said, admiring that very grin. Let's get to work. He moved to the section next to hers and pushed back the leaves. Oh, and Jake? Man, he liked the sound of his name in her voice. Mm-hmm. Thanks for doing this. My dad and I really appreciate it. A sudden warmth seeped into his chest. He gave her a wink, unable to hold back the gesture. My pleasure. Meg pulled in a deep breath as she picked the next cluster, recalling the words of her mother. No better scent in all the world. The memory along with the others that drifted through her mind scratched at the ache in her heart, making it raw and new once more. Part of Meg wished she was alone so she could unleash a fresh round of tears. But a growing part of her was glad she had company. Meg had endured more breakdowns than she could count over the years. She needed to let the scab of time do its job. You uh, should have seen how jealous the guys were about the auction, Jake said. Jealous? The word came out in a squeak. Of course. I'm the only guy who got snatched up by a hot babe. Meg's pruners weren't quite in place, but at Jake's words they snapped shut, snipping into the cluster. A handful of grapes scattered to the ground. A rush of heat moved up her neck, began creeping towards her face. Wow, that's... She let out a nervous laugh. It was for my father, not me. And let's not forget that group of women who are also trying to snatch you up, as you say. I'm glad they didn't get me. Couple of real man-eaters in there, I'll tell you that, he chuckled. I've had women bid on me before, thinking they'd use me for their own, uh, personal wishes. Never did work out for them seeing that my conscience wouldn't allow it. Though, for you... I'd have been willing to make an exception. Meg was so glad he couldn't see the reaction on her jaw-dropped face. She was also glad he wasn't aware of the odd thrill that rushed through her body at his brazen words, the cool tingles buzzing over her skin. Michael never said suggestive things like that. Never. She searched for something snarky to put him in his place, her mind rapidly at work as she snipped the next bunch of grapes and then the next. Yet as she reached for yet another cluster, no witty words coming to mind, Jake spoke up again. The Barnharts pulled out the old yearbook after the fair, he said. Meg cringed. You're kidding. Nope, a couple of those Barnhart boys had a crush on you over the years. She shook her head while lowering a bundle into the growing mound. I doubt that. It's the truth, he assured. They were pretty miffed about the whole thing. Wondering why you never bid on any of them, seeing that you know them and all. She let out an incredulous laugh. Because I've never bid on anyone. I haven't needed to. Yeah, well, don't worry. I explained it to him. Meg's eyes widened as Jake's sentence seemed to linger longer than it should. By saying what? She finally asked. Oh, you know he said, voice puffed with pride. 
I told them you'd never seen someone quite so handsome step onto that stage before you couldn't resist. Her eyes grew impossibly larger. She pulled away from her task to look over at him. Jake backed out of the foliage, glanced over his shoulder and shot her a wink. That was the second time he'd winked at her. Another thing Michael never did. Flirt. She'd always been glad that Michael never came across as the womanizing type. The thing was, Jake didn't either. But he was definitely charming. Dangerously so. Even her body knew the truth of it. The way her chest would tighten and her heart would race, like it had back at the auction. Still, there was no need for him to know of his effect on her. Whatever makes you feel good inside, cowboy. Cowboy? Had she really just called him cowboy? She imagined the grin that spread over his face at her comeback, somehow knowing it'd make him smile. With a solid hold on her overflowing basket, Meg made her way to the work table. Once you're done, you can meet over here and we'll rinse them off. In the quiet moment, she let the sun sink into her skin, feeding the starving parts of her soul, the parts that had blocked out the sun since her mother died. She hadn't expected Jake to join her so soon, but in a few short moments, she heard the sweep of his footsteps through the grass, felt his arm brush against her as he slid his basket next to hers. My mom used to let me skip a day of school for this, she explained, forcing her eyes open. We'd spend the whole day picking, processing, playing cards between batches, she smiled. For lunch, we'd order takeout, usually Chinese. Jake's eyes seemed to search her face before locking on hers. That sounds nice. I bet this really makes you miss her. It does. But even as she said it, Meg realized that Jake had managed to distract her. It was just that she hadn't anticipated what the sunlight could do to a face like his. A short shadow of facial hair covered his solid, angular jaw following the perfect outline of his mouth. And what a mouth it was. Her fingers nearly ached to sketch out the shape of his lips on a fresh canvas. Her insides tumbled and tossed with a strange and unfamiliar desire, a desire that triggered a spark of fear within her. Jake's brow furrowed. My father left nine years ago. He's still alive as far as I know, but none of us have spoken with him. He gulped, licked his lips. So, uh, I know what it's like to miss someone that way. I'm sorry. The ache in her heart twisted deeper as she considered the difference. While her mother was taken from them against her will, Jake's father had walked out on his family completely. That must have been hard. Nine years. Meg took a moment to count back. So you were, what, in middle school? He nodded. I used to fantasize about him coming back one day. I stayed on the honor roll all through school, just, I don't know, hoping he'd maybe see the listing in the paper. Come back, I guess. Her heart gave out a strange, drawn-out beat, as if it had been snared by a hook, and Jake held the reel. I'm sorry that he never did, she said. He shrugged. Worked out all right. I'm the oldest in the family, so I grew up pretty fast. My things eased up when my mom got remarried. Was in my junior year when I started working for the Barnharts full-time. Huh, she mumbled, surprised by the natural ease in conversation. The emotion he'd pulled from her with just a few words. My dad said the other ranch hands all left for the season. But you stay on through fall and winter. He nodded reaching for the hose beneath the table. Yep, I help my granddad, too. His ranch isn't nearly as big as the barn hearts, but between the two, I stay pretty busy. Jake twisted the squeaky faucet, running his fingers through the water as it splashed from the hose. So what do you do all day? Ride around on your horse, herd cows from one field to the next? She asked it with a laugh, but Meg was truly curious. You got it. He moved the hose to his other hand and tipped his cowboy hat. Nah, it really depends on the season. There's calving that happens in spring, immunizations to follow, and all that's required to get past the cell in the fall and the snow in the winter. He lifted the sprayer over his basket, 
No matter the season, we spend the day out in the fresh open air. It's what I love most about it. Hmm, was all she could say. Inwardly, she was picturing Jake on the land, putting in a hard day's work. Am I doing this right? Just rinse them off like this. Yeah, Meg snapped out of her daze. I'll get the processor going. We might be able to finish a batch before dinner. She didn't wait for him to respond. Simply sped towards the patio door, hoping the action looked more graceful than it felt. Once safe from Jake's presence, she attacked the questions in her head. How did this man manage to put her at ease, yet make her so unsettled all at once? And just what were all of these strange feelings about? This new onslaught of undeniable... She searched for the right word, unsure of how to identify it until it jumped out at her. Attraction. No, that couldn't be it. But her pounding heart said that it was the exact definition. The thumping picked up pace as she thundered down the basement stairs. Recognizing the feeling, putting a name to it even, frightened her. She hadn't felt anything for anyone besides Michael in years. In fact, if Meg had it her way, the two would have married by now. She dragged the processor off the shelf, lugged the thing back upstairs, and filled the base with hot water from the tap. A splash of vinegar to the base, and it was ready for the stovetop. She fired up the burner, headed back downstairs to shut out the lights, and tried to guess at why she felt such a thing for this guy she didn't even know. A laugh spilled through her lips as she realized what it was. His looks. She shook her head, chuckling once again. Of course you're attracted to him, Meg. Geez, what woman wouldn't be? He was a prime example of the perfect male. In physicality, anyway. With Michael, things went much deeper. She was attracted to his mind and his soul not just his appearance. A wash of relief swept through her, putting her mind at ease once again. She was simply experiencing the early stage of some teenage-type crush, unfounded, immature, and best of all, fleeting. She'd be disillusioned by dinner and her thoughts would return to the place they belonged, Michael and their future. Yet there was one voice that stood out among the rest, a stubborn little voice that made Meg second-guess that notion. What if this was the answer she'd been searching for all along? What if there was a reason she'd been at that fair on that day to bid on that particular man? A man who'd already managed to snare a tiny piece of her heart. It took a spark of bravery, but Meg found it in herself to accept an inward challenge. This week, she would do her best to use the freedom Michael had given her. She'd been set on ignoring other men, determined to prove that he was the one for her. But she couldn't deny the increasing emptiness she'd felt since graduating. The feeling that she was attempting to set her roots in a place she didn't belong, so she'd use this week as a chance to test the homeland waters. Perhaps Michael had been right in giving her space. Maybe, just maybe, she'd find that lost happiness by going back to her roots. Chapter 4 Meg squeezed a wedge of lemon over the salmon filet on her plate, inhaling the fresh citrus scent. Boy, if I'd known grilled fish could taste this good, her dad said. I'd have grilled it a long time ago. Jake flashed a triumphant grin. Billy wasn't kidding when he said I knew my way around the kitchen, but I'm definitely best with a grill. Her dad lifted his glass and held it toward the center of the table. The dark purple juice took on a red hue beneath the dining room light. This is the last of what your mother made, he said, looking at Meg with a sad sort of smile. I know she was screaming from the heavens, scolding us for letting those grapes go bad the last few years. Feels nice to be making up for lost time. Meg lifted her own glass. You're right, it does. And we sure are glad to have your help, Jake, he added reaching further toward the center of the group. Arms extended, glasses clanked, and Meg brought her drink to her lips. Dang, that's good, Jake said. Is this the same type of juice we made today? Doesn't have any sugar or anything. It's the exact thing, her dad said. One hundred percent juice. Meg glanced at the small batch of jars lined up on the counter. 
What a satisfying thing it had been to count the gold lids beneath the light, testing the tops of each sealed jar. She was starting to see why Mom enjoyed it so much, why she never complained about the task that took more than half the month of October for her to complete. You two seem to make a fine team, her dad said, and I'm glad. It appears I'll be missing the action most of the week. What do you mean? Meg asked. I've got a client who flew in from the East Coast. He wants a mountain property here, so I'll be showing him a dozen or more cabins throughout the week. Few of the places are clear out in Hamilton. Means we'll probably be gone from sunup to sundown in the next few days. Meg's eyes shot to Jake. His moved to hers. All unspoken spark danced in the space between them. A teasing, taunting, wanting spark that sent an electric thrill right through her chest. The words, alone with Jake, flittered through her mind. So how much has Meg told you about herself, Jake? Jake glanced at her dad with a grin. Not a whole lot. I was hoping you could fill me in on all of her deep, dark secrets. Her dad chuckled. Oh, I'm not even sure her Mason could do that. Michael, Meg corrected, shocked that he'd brought him up. Oh, yeah, I can never get that kid's name straight. Anyway, Maggie here, just one year into working toward her degree, started an online shopping site for independent artists. In addition to helping hundreds of fellow artists sell their work, she sold thousands of her own patents throughout the country. Jake's gaze met hers once more, an unreadable look in his eyes. That's impressive. Is she the one who painted the picture in the front room? Yep, that's hers, all right. It's really old, Meg blurted. I was only 14, so it's not very good. It's better than anything I could do, Jake mumbled. Her dad gave her the exact look he dealt every time she bagged on that painting. Disappointment mingled with hurt. He didn't understand how hard it was to have someone showing off a piece that didn't reflect her current ability. To her, it was like framing some rough draft of unfinished work and displaying it for all to see. If the subject of the art weren't so dear to them both, Meg would have insisted he take it down long ago. As it was, she didn't push. So what about you, Jake? Billy said you'd be running a ranch of your own soon, is that right? Jake set his glass down with a nod. My granddad owns a ranch. He'd like me to take over next year so he can retire. Visions of the handsome cowboy running a ranch of his own flooded Meg's mind once more. Sweet country life. A life any woman would be lucky to have. Meg dug her fork into her baked potato, confused by her shift in opinion. Since moving to Colorado, Meg had been certain she'd never move back. Perhaps her feelings for Michael were fading faster than she wanted to admit. After all, he'd been her greatest incentive to stay. So does that mean you'll eventually inherit the land when the time comes? Her dad asked. That's right, Jake said. My granddad promised my grandma they'd move someplace where he doesn't have to do a scrap of yard work. The home, the ranch, all of it'll be mine. Meg had been surrounded by ranching property most of her life. Some with small, weathered homes and rundown barns. Others with well-kept structures donning fresh paint and magazine appeal. All of it held beauty in Meg's eyes. Only now, it held a new sort of appeal. My country art, paintings I've done of the Montana landscape, she said. They're my best sellers. When the two looked at her, Meg elaborated. Guess a lot of people out there either live in the country life and want something to reflect it, or they simply dream of it, hanging paintings that show a simpler, perhaps more desired lifestyle. You're right, her father said. Against her will, Meg's eyes shifted to Jake. His gaze was set on her, his brow puckered the slightest bit. There weren't many times Meg had wished she could read another's mind. Mostly, she was glad she couldn't. But in that moment, with that particular cowboy looking at her the way he was, she'd give anything to know what he was thinking. The conversation continued throughout the remainder of dinner, but Meg didn't take part in much of it. She was too caught up in her thoughts trying to figure out just what was influencing her most in those moments. A desire to be near her family once more? To live in the quiet town she had such a love for? 
or was she simply under the spell of the far too charming cowboy at her table? You're just tired, Meg assured herself. Michael had said he'd be busy with homework, that she didn't need to check in with him each night. But Meg was certain she should. She needed to get her head straight, to remind herself why she'd wanted a life that was starting to seem so undesirable to her. Yep, that's all she needed. A good talk with Michael would put things back in their place. Chapter 5 Jake smiled as he watched Meg meticulously arrange raspberries atop a slice of cheesecake. She leaned to one side, reached blindly for the hot fudge, and grabbed the spoon inside. With delicate strokes, she dragged the spoon over the dessert, drizzling a pattern along the cake and plate alike. There, she said in a whisper. Yours is ready. Well, now that's just too pretty to eat. He reached across the bar where he sat on a tall stool. Didn't your father say he was going to join us for dessert? He'd been the one to send them out for it, after all. He sent me a text while we were at the checkout, Meg said, her eyes pasted on her next work of art. He said he got impatient, finished off a pint of ice cream, and was headed for bed, so it's just us. Why information like that had to make Jake's belly fire up with heat was beyond him. He'd been alone with her all afternoon. Would be for nearly the whole week, from what her father said. Still, there was something about the night hours. A more lively, daring side that crept out after dark. He liked the idea of seeing that side of Meg. So, what makes you decide to paint a subject? The question was sparked by the fact that she looked like she was about to whip out a canvas and paint her neatly designed cheesecake right then and there. Meg looked at him like she'd been caught in the act of an addiction, her eyes wide, almost repentant. She chuckled as her cheeks showed off that pink again. It was different beneath the kitchen light's glow, her skin looking a shade lighter than before. Usually, I just find myself admiring something. The delicate petals of a Wilton flower, the tiny seeds of a strawberry, cheesecake, she said with a laugh. I don't know, suddenly inspiration strikes and I either pull out my supplies right then or snap a few pictures of it so I can paint it another time. Jake couldn't get over the odd feeling that he and Meg were on a first date of sorts. Even then it felt as if she'd simply invited him back to her place for a nightcap. Knowing that her dad was just down the hall gave life to that impression, making him feel like he was back in high school as well. He grinned, appreciating a few of her mannerisms. The way she ran a hand down the back of her neck after tucking her reddish-blonde hair behind one ear. The coy smile she flashed him when she caught him looking at her. You don't like the painting you did in the front room, he said. Her cheeks went from pink to red. She pulled open a drawer, absently shaking her head as she dug into it. She gave him a fork before setting one next to her own plate. I did it when I was 14, you know? It's just amateur compared to what I can do now. Has several classic beginner's mistakes. But you don't want to make him take it down, he said, gauging the reaction on her face, and in the slight shrug of one slender shoulder. Not really. How can I when it's of my mother? He nodded, took a bite of his cheesecake, and wondered why he wanted to solve this problem for her. It was just that he sensed it was more of a sore spot than she let on. So I'm guessing you did that painting live, he said. Not from a picture. Meg nodded. You don't know how badly I wish he had a picture of her there. It's not that I couldn't paint a different one. But that was her favorite place in the world to be. On that porch while the sun set. Quiet took over while they ate their dessert. Meg from her side of the counter, Jake from his. I could always try to recreate it from the painting, she said, proving the subject was still on her mind. But I know I don't have her face right. I can't handle the thought of redoing it and still not getting it the way I want. Yeah, that makes sense. He forced himself to drop the subject. This was obviously an issue that had bothered her for years. He wasn't likely to come in and solve it in just one day but there was one thing he still wanted to say. You know, I 
really admire the fact that you put yourself out there the way you do with your paintings. And to hear that you found a way to sell it to folks all over the country? He shook his head. Bet your mom's doing a whole lot of bragging from those clouds up there. Thanks. He loved the smile that spread over her face, accenting a splash of freckles across her cheeks. He made a mental note to do all that he could to see that smile often in the days ahead. Well, I think it's incredible that you do this whole auction thing, she countered. Donate a week of your time, half of your wages even? All to live in some stranger's house, do whatever grunt work they've laid out for you? I bet your mom's pretty proud herself. As nice as it was to hear, Meg's comment sparked a dose of emotion in Jake. I hope so. It's definitely for a good cause. There was no need to elaborate. Billy explained their cause at every auction, an organization to help children of rare disease, an illness their family had lost a daughter to years back. The Barnhart said you created an after-school class for the special needs kids in your area, that you taught them how to paint, provided the materials even. Sure, he was revealing more about himself than he should, the fact that he'd done his homework on her, but he didn't mind was too interested in getting to know this intriguing woman to hold anything back. Yeah, I have some pretty fond memories from that time in my life. She flicked a few raspberries off her cheesecake. How many siblings do you have? Jake grinned. Four. My two younger sisters and my stepdad has swim boys. They're a whole lot of fun, those little rascals. Do they want to be cowboys when they grow up, just like you? He chuckled. As a matter of fact, they do. But we'll see if it ever takes. They're good kids, though. And my sisters, they're driving and dating and about ready to make my head spin with how quickly they're growing up. I moved out a few years back, and even though I see them most weekends, I could swear they change every time. Looking older or prettier. More like young ladies than little girls. So you've got a nice big family, huh? She cut a bite of cheesecake with the side of her fork, resting it there on her plate. I envy that. It gets me thinking I've really been missing my dad a lot. It sounded like a confession whispered and rushed. I miss being around my family, you know? Jake's pulse pumped a little faster, hotter, excited by the way she was confiding in him in return. After my mom died, she continued, I was torn. Part of me was glad to be gone because it hurt less while I was away. But I had guilt, too, knowing my dad was here by himself, and I know he's not getting any younger. A hint of moisture glistened in the corners of her eyes. She cleared her throat, shrugging with that same shoulder. It's not something I've entertained a whole lot, but I work from home, you know, and I can do that from virtually anywhere. Yet I've been set on staying in Colorado. It's where I live now, plus it's where... She stopped there, reminding Jake of something her father brought up at dinner. Mason? Or was it Michael? Whichever it was, Thomas had preceded the guy's name with one very important word. A word that implied Meg wasn't exactly available. Her. He'd called him Her Mason. He wasn't even sure her Mason could tell Jake about Meg's deep, dark secrets. A sting of jealousy burst in like an intruder. He had absolutely no right to feel it. None. But he was there all the same. I don't know, Meg said, shifting his train of thought. I guess I'm still trying to work it out? Hold up. Still trying to work it out? Did that mean... You're saying you might move back? She tilted her head to one side, pushed out her bottom lip. Maybe. All at once, Jake wanted to celebrate. After all, how great could her relationship with this guy be if she was thinking of leaving him behind? Untouched glasses of bubbly stood in the center of the counter, forgotten until that moment. Something Meg's father had set out for them. Jake reached out, slid one glass toward Meg, and took hold of the other glad to find that it was still cool. A toast, he said, tilting his glass towards her. To good old Montana living. May this week be a success, and may you find yourself never wanting to leave. He gave her a wink, 
Cheers. There went that blush on her cheeks, that smile on her lips. She gave him a slight nod before clanking her glass against his. Cheers. Chapter 6 Heat rose from the steamer as Meg pulled off the lid. Bright rays of morning sunlight illuminated the steam as it danced toward the copper vent. Ready? Jake asked. She nodded, and Jake tipped the basket he held, allowing clusters of grapes to drop inside. Meg reached up, created a wall around the rim with her hands, blocking the fruit from tumbling over the edge. So, who's this Mason guy your dad talked about last night? Whoa. Meg did not want to look at Jake during the awkward moment, but it felt as if she didn't have any control over the matter. Her gaze drifted to him in a slow and steady move, just as it had when her father brought him up at dinner. His name's Michael, and he's a guy I've been seeing for a while now. Three years. Say it, Meg. Three full years. He doesn't want to commit, though, so... Holy crap. Why had she said that? How long is a while? Mmm. Meg took the emptied basket from Jake, trying desperately to squelch her annoyance with Michael. He hadn't answered even one of her texts from the night before. Texts that said things like, I'm here, how are you? Got time to talk? So, how long? Jake prodded. She straightened up. Over two years now. He coughed low in his throat. (laughs) Over two years, and he doesn't want to commit. She cringed, glad she wasn't facing him as she searched for her regulars. The fallback list of defenses she used where Michael was concerned. He's scared to get serious with anyone because he had a bad breakup before I came along. I assume he lives in Colorado, Jake said. Right. She spun around, avoiding his gaze while reaching for the lid. She placed it lopsidedly on the heaping mound, knowing once the steam did its job, the grapes would reduce and the lid would fit snug. What else had to be done? There had to be something she could say or do to get the focus off the stale, stagnant, frustrating, and futile relationship that she could not let go of no matter how infuriating it got. So you're telling me, though the two of you have been dating all this time, if someone else wanted to take you on a date, you could say yes, and he wouldn't care? Meg's heart misunderstood the question. While her ears and mind had heard him say, if someone else wanted to take you out, her heart heard something different. Something along the lines of, if I wanted to take you out, as in him. She nodded until her mouth remembered how to make words. If I wanted to say yes, Michael would have no objection. What a jackass. The words might have been mumbled, but there was no mistaking them. Excuse me? Meg turned around to see Jake leaning against the counter, his arms folded across his chest. You heard me. He's a jackass. What is he waiting for? Her jaw had dropped open once the name-calling began, but her thoughts were derailed by that nagging, taunting, stupid, stupid, stupid question. The million-dollar question she had absolutely no answer for. He's... You have no right to call him that. Don't I? No, you don't. Jake held her gaze, his lean against the counter looking like the cover of some cowboy in the kitchen magazine. Featuring men who could ride, cook, and get a woman's temper flared with a single word. He's a fool to say the least, and in my book, those things go hand in hand. She tightened her lips, rubbed them together, and forced herself to take two full breaths before speaking. You don't really know me, and you certainly don't know him, so I'd appreciate it if we could just let the subject drop, all right? There. She'd done it. Classy. She'd kept it classy, the way Mom always taught. She bolted for the fridge, reached in aimlessly, and snatched a carton of eggs. Would you go out with me? Meg made her way to the counter without dropping a single egg, which felt like a big accomplishment even with the carton fully closed. She also didn't trip or slip or faint, though suddenly she felt close to doing all three. Why? Aren't you committed to somebody? You're railing on Michael because he's not committed, but now you're telling me that you aren't either, so what makes you any better? 
Sure, it was a dumb argument. A weak attempt to shift things around, but what else did she have? From her peripheral, she saw him drop his arms, pull away from the counter, and start walking toward her. I haven't been stringing some devoted woman along for the last two years. I'm not committed because I haven't met the person I'd like to commit to. Have you? He lowered his voice for that question, in volume and pitch. Yet, he'd simultaneously and quite magically heighten the sensuality of it, causing an explosion of goosebumps to break out over her skin. At last, the two-worded questions sunk deeper. The sound of it echoed in Meg's head, giving life to a lurking fear within her, one that was hidden behind walls so thick and deep even she couldn't see past them. What would happen if Michael wasn't the right one? And why did the thought terrify her so completely? Meg kept her gaze on the carton of eggs, unwilling to respond to his question. Jake's focus was set on her, and she wanted nothing more than to look unaffected. But she couldn't get herself to move. She felt paralyzed, locked in a puzzle that could take years to solve. Jake turned away from her, and Meg's shoulders dropped a notch, the tension in them starting to ease. He set a small bowl on the counter, grabbed an egg out of the carton, and held it before her. Would you like scrambled or fried? It took a moment for the egg to come into view. Huh? Or poached. I make a mean poached egg. She hid a grin, appreciating the topic change, and glanced over in time to catch that dimple sink into his cheek. Surprise me. There's some deli ham in the fridge, he said. How about a ham and cheese omelet? Meg let the reluctant grin slip. That sounds wonderful. She got out the bread, put a few slices in the toaster while Jake worked on the omelets. Soon, he switched the conversation to talk of his little brothers and sisters, and began asking about what it was like growing up with only one sibling. While she was enjoying the conversation, and the omelet, a part of Meg was stuck musing on the mystery he was. She couldn't help but replay the encounter in her head. Jake's challenge where Michael was concerned the way she'd clammed up in response. Jake had nearly cornered her with his question, and just when she'd reached the point of unraveling, he'd given her a way out. But why? Had he sensed her distress? Taken pity on her? Pity. Meg despised that word. Yet her position with Michael, someone she couldn't even call her boyfriend, was nothing short of pathetic, and Meg knew it. Would you go out with me? Jake's question repeated in her mind again and again, each time sending a thrill through her body anew. And as breakfast finished up, she and Jake started the task of picking the next batch. Meg came up with a surprising answer to that question. Yes. Sure, she hadn't gone out with someone other than Michael in close to three years. But something about this cowboy had her aching to give it a shot. If he was really interested, that is. For now, it was hard to say. But still, she felt good about her new position on the prospect. If Jake actually did ask her out on a date, Meg would say yes. Chapter 7 Jake set a freshly sealed jar next to the line of others. The marble counter, covered with a spread of hand towels, now held dozens of quarts of grape juice. Day number three and things were running better than clockwork with a kick. Throughout the full day, he'd picked over half a dozen bushels, helped process several quarts per bushel, and beyond that, he'd managed to go the entire day without razzing Meg over her pathetic excuse for a boyfriend. Some boyfriend? Refusing to commit after years of dating? Tied her down with invisible strings is what he'd done. The poor girl didn't dare look at another man, it seemed. Though even as the thought crossed his mind... Jake knew Meg Bolton had done her fair share of looking at him. He glanced up at the clock on the wall, noting the time before letting his gaze drop to the framed painting below, a piece that had caught his eye nearly each time he checked the clock. Tell me about this one, he said, making his way around the corner to stand before it. The square-shaped canvas, accented by thick gray matting, was a solid plum color, the shades varying slightly around the edge. What made it interesting was the intricate pattern covering the surface. 
clear, bead-like spots ranging from pearl size to minuscule. Meg stirred in the kitchen a bit before making her way behind him. Quite close behind him, he noted. His belly stirred with heat. He pulled in a deep breath of her sweet vanilla scent, willing her to step even closer. But all too soon she was gone, heading back towards the stove. I'll show you. Jake's brow furrowed. Show me. Yep. She pulled a kettle from the back of the stovetop, filled it with water, and set it back on the burner. It'll just take a minute. With a small nod, he joined her back at the stove. The oven was wide open. A rack pulled out where a cookie sheet served as a work base. Meg, standing on the other side of the workspace, nodded to the processor. Think we've got enough here to fill one more? He lifted the lid and looked inside, seeing nothing but shriveled grape skins and wilted vines. Definitely, he said. Taking hold of the processor, Jake tipped it forward while Meg placed a heated jar beneath the short, pliable hose. She released the clamp, allowing a slow stream to come through. The dark, heated liquid filled the jar in a steady flow until it was halfway full, the juice slowing down to a trickle. Hold on. Jake secured the lid and tipped it further toward her until it flowed through once more. Almost there, Meg said. Her lashes were lovely from this angle. He freed one hand from the pot, let the back of his fingers glide gently along her wrist, and watched her unconscious reaction come to life. That soft, rosy glow. She smiled, biting at her lower lip. And perfect. Jake gulped. Yes, she was. He set the steamer upright, glad to have her so near. Sure, the open oven put a bit of a distance between them, but with both leaning over the same task, they'd eliminated that with ease. Thanks, she said in a whisper. You're welcome. Meg reached for the spoon, scooped a few bubbles off the top, and then wiped down the rim. Before she could reach for a lid, Jake held one before her with a set of tongs. Here's a lid, he mumbled, in the ring, he said next, handing over a canning ring. After Meg placed it around the rim, he leaned down and twisted it on with one hand. And we're done. His lip grazed the outer curve of her ear as he'd set it, and a trail of goosebumps spread over her arms. There went that heat in his belly, roaring hotter than the stovetop beside him. His gaze drifted to her lips as they straightened up, and he'd be damned if hers didn't do the same. Jake reminded himself of why he was there. Her father. He'd put down good money for him to help his daughter with this task, not to make out with her the first chance he got. A blasting whistle pierced the air like the call of foul play startling him until he remembered the kettle she'd put on. Oh, it's ready, she said, seeming to snap out of some sort of spell. Whatever it was, Jake knew he'd fallen victim to it too. Let me show you. She went to work grabbing a mug, a bag of tea, and a saucer that was precisely the same color as the painting. In the tea bag, the water came next, and then came the plate on top of the mug. Meg folded her arms and looked at the clock. We'll let that steep for a couple of minutes, then you'll see. He nodded, enjoying the quiet moment with her, even if she had moved to the opposite end of the counter. Suddenly, as if she'd just remembered something, Meg threw a hand to her forehead and tipped back with a groan. I keep forgetting about dinner. Sorry. I'll have to grab a few cans of soup to heat up, I guess. That's fine by me. Only Jake actually had something else in store. Something that should arrive any minute. Meg grabbed the edge of the plate, flipped it over, and walked toward him while holding it under the light. See that? Beyond the windows, it was dark out, but the lights in the kitchen seemed to mimic the outdoor glow. He leaned down a bit, scrutinizing the saucer as they came together. Condensation, he said. She nodded. Isn't it gorgeous? Do you see how teeny tiny those outer drops are? And it's almost in this crazy pattern, like 
an animal print or something. I'll be damned, he mumbled, recognizing the look of it right away. Boy, did he love her passion. I can't imagine noticing that type of thing on my own. Meg shrugged modestly, her eyes lingering on his face once more. Jake knew there was no pulling his gaze off her. It was like hypnosis minus the words. Some unspoken trance when their eyes met. Guess it's uh, time to scrounge up some dinner. Yet, just as Meg said it, the doorbell rang. Her eyes widened before she broke their gaze with the slow turn of her head. Jake cleared his throat and strode towards the door. I'll get it, he mumbled. It's for me. Meg's curiosity rose as Jake pulled open the door. She heard a bit of mumbling, but couldn't decipher what was said. Mere seconds later, he closed the door and made his way back toward the kitchen. Suddenly, a delicious, familiar aroma cut through the tart, tangy scent that had permeated the home since they'd started the grapes. She worked to place it as she saw a plastic sack in his hand. Chinese food. His smile widened. You mentioned that you ate Chinese takeout with your mom when you made juice with her, he said. Thought we may as well keep up the tradition. Swoony, melty, tingly things were happening to her insides, the kind gesture reaching every possible corner of her heart, branding it with a moment she would never forget. That was so thoughtful. Emotion tightened her throat. Thank you. My pleasure. She noticed him eyeing the clock, recalling a conversation she'd overheard between Jake and her dad, something about a college football game that would be on that night. What time does your game start? she asked. Jake tilted his head in question. College football, she said. You better watch it so you can let my dad know how it goes. Jake looked as if he was fighting off a smile. It starts in ten minutes. Then how about we take this downstairs and eat in front of the TV? He nodded, unleashing that grin after all. Sounds good to me. Meg reached for the remote as credits scrolled down the massive flat screen. She was about to turn it off but opted to mute the thing instead. The closing song blasted so loud she feared it might wake up Jake. He'd made it through the game just fine. The following sitcom, not so much. Once the sound was off, the screen still offering its generous glow, Meg climbed off her corner of the couch. Empty takeout boxes stood scattered along the coffee table. Chopsticks and napkins lay nearby. She got to her knees and tidied the area up as quietly as she could, stacking boxes before placing them in the sack they came in. Once the table was nearly clear, a small white slip caught her eye, the fortune she'd found in her cookie earlier. She took hold of the slip, curling the edge around her fingers she read it once more. It is foolish to resist change in life. Embrace new things, and you will find what you're looking for. She turned to look back over her shoulder, smiling at the way Jake was sprawled out. The sofa had seats that reclined the way a lounge chair did, and though Jake's was fully reclined, his long legs didn't quite fit. Everything from mid-calf down protruding over the edge. Parts of the fortune played through her mind as she climbed back onto the couch. The center seat this time. Foolish to resist change. Her gaze ran over his face the peaceful expression making him look a bit younger than before. Not too young, though, seeing that he'd skipped a razor the last day or two. That late-night shadow he favored gave him that extra masculine appeal, the way it framed those lips of his. An urge struck her then, a deep and driving desire. What would happen if she leaned over and kissed those lips? She and Jake had been getting a whole lot closer, He'd been flirting with her nonstop the last few days. Meg had done a good share of flirting right back. She had wondered on more than one occasion if he might ask her out after all. There was even one point, when the two had gotten in a water fight out back, that she thought he might kiss her. Meg had spent the following evening wishing he'd done that very thing. She'd wondered just what his lips would feel like on hers. It wouldn't be some meaningless kiss— not with the kind of sparks the two had. 
and the connection they'd made. It was odd, though. She couldn't shake the feeling that his resistance stemmed from fear. But fear of what? Rejection? Fear of offending her? She wasn't sure. She only knew that in that moment, she could put all those fears to rest. She gulped, rested a hand along the back of the couch, her knuckles grazing over his broad shoulder. Her pulse raced. She paused, wondering if her touch would wake him. Her eyes landed on his well-formed chest, watching for any change in his breathing. In it came, then out, slow and even. Okay, you can do this, Meg. She leaned in closer, appreciating the warmth of him as she neared, and the scent of him, too. Spicy and fresh and intoxicating. Jake's head was gently tipped to one side, the side facing her as luck would have it. She brought her head closer to his, her shadow blocking him from the light of the screen and fear kicked in. Seconds ago, she'd wondered what Jake was afraid of. Now she was bombarded with doubts of her own. What if he hadn't wanted to move things in this direction? What if she'd read him wrong all along? What if he flinched back and knocked her out while in some sleeping stupor? Her heart made its presence known in the heightened moment, thumping like a loud and angry chant. Go. Do it. Move in. She licked her lips, gulped back her fear, and inched forward at last, moving until their mouths met with the slightest, most enticing touch. Holy, holy. A rush of euphoria spilled over her body, urging her to come in again, using a bit more pressure this time. Mmm, so good. She stayed a sliver away, contemplating another kiss and felt Jake's lips part. Her heart skipped an entire beat. Had he come to his senses? And if so, what was going through his head? The question had barely come to her when Jake gave her the answer. Softly, gently, he closed the gap between them, planting a sweet, sensual kiss to her lips. Meg felt herself lean in once the seal was broken, a near desperation for more. Jake's hand found the back of her neck, cradled her there while his warm breath fused with hers, feeding the charged current between them. Meg, he said, voice deep and raspy. He kissed her again, strong and certain, the push and pull of his mouth weaving a spell over her, a spell of desire, a spell of bliss. Adding to the ecstasy, Meg felt a rush of triumph. She'd been the one to initiate that kiss, and the outcome was more rewarding than she could have imagined. At once, Jake's arm encircled her back, bringing her impossibly closer while deepening the kiss. Her hand moved to his chest as she steadied herself, the rapid pounding of his heated heart strong beneath her palm. A small whine of pleasure sounded from low in her throat, she sensed urgency in that kiss, an acknowledgement of sorts. Their days together were limited and coming to an end, an end that, it turned out, neither of them wanted. An intruding creak broke into the moment, causing them to break the seal of their lips. Jake leaned his forehead against hers. Meg caught her breath while listening for further sounds of her dad's entry. Kids? The way he'd said it, hollering from the top of the stairs, made Meg feel like that very thing, a kid, caught making out in the dark. She shifted away from Jake, bolting toward the lamp as she replied, Yeah? A pool of bright light struck her eyes with a sharp sting. We're down here, just watching a show. Jake repositioned himself in the seat while footsteps sounded down the stairs. What is it you're watching? Thomas asked, eyeing the quiet screen. Meg's eyes shot to the TV. It's over now. I'm, I'm not sure what this is. What it was, was an infomercial. Put on mute, no less. Her face filled with warmth beneath her dad's gaze. He took a moment to look back and forth between the two of them, loosening his tie as he did. 
How much do I owe you for the Chinese? He asked, turning his attention to Jake. Oh, nothing, it's on me. Did you see the cartons up there in the fridge? Sure did, her dad replied. Thank you. It's been a long time since I've had takeout from that place. Meg fiddled with her earlobe, cleared her throat, and wondered how long it would take the awkwardness to leave the room. Well, her dad finally said, I'm going to go on up and eat. Good night, Mr. Bolton, Jake said. Meg couldn't get herself to look over at Jake or her dad. Good night. She let her gaze move over to Jake in a slow crawl, across his long legs, up that magnificent chest, and right on that devilish handsome grin. He shot her a wink. That was close, he mumbled. Meg nodded in agreement, the effects of his kiss still surging through every part of her body. Oh, and kids, Thomas called once more. Meg stiffened. Yeah. The juice looks great. Sure is nice to come home to so many courts lined up like that. I've, uh, missed it. A sigh of relief washed over her. The comment made Meg realize how much she had been missing as well. Being at home. Being with her dad. But she'd been missing something even more. And as the tips of her fingers drifted to her bottom lip, grazed over the place where Jake had kissed her, the word shot to the front of her mind passion. Jake had kissed her like he wanted nothing more in all the world, like she was the only thing that mattered. It was beyond anything she'd experienced with Michael, and the sheer acknowledgement alarmed her. I I should go up too so he's not eaten alone. She came to a stand vaguely noticing that Jake was climbing out of his reclining corner of the couch. Wait. The single word hinted of desperation taking Meg off guard. She spun around, glanced down as Jake's hands encircled her arms. Such a familiar, if not intimate, gesture. He lowered his chin, leveled his eyes with hers, and released a look of concern that pierced through all dozen layers protecting her heart. I don't know what's going on in that head of yours, he said, but what you started tonight... His lips tightened as he glanced at the screen, then back again, the light illuminating his unceasingly gorgeous face. What you started was something I've wanted since we met. It was out of respect for your father that I didn't move in on my own. He stepped closer, shifting his hands from her arms to her waist. I know we're just getting to know one another, but I don't know. Feels like I've known you for years. The truth of his words resonated with her, deeply, thoroughly, as he lowered his head. He pressed the most tender, exquisite kiss to her lips, dragging out the single motion until she ached for more. Slow, sensual, and... mm. He kissed her again, and then again, luring her into a lover's lock like she'd never known. Her hands moved to his arm, gripping around his biceps as the passion intensified, morphed into this living, thriving source. Jake pulled back the slightest bit and released a shaky breath. She ran her hand up the back of his neck, could sense that he was trembling, just barely. He grazed his mouth over her lips, back and forth, before murmuring against her. Five simple words that nearly made her heart stop. I'm falling for you, Meg. Chapter 8 A familiar ding pulled Meg from her sleep, had her fighting to pry her eyes open. When it sounded again, she placed it as a text notification on her phone. Her shoulders sunk back into the bed, Who cared about a text when sleep was feeling so good? Not to mention the dream. A rush of euphoria spilled over her as she thought back on the moment she'd been reliving for the last two days straight, being held in Jake's strong arms, relishing each passionate kiss, and the sound of her name on his lips. Mmm, so perfect. It had been the absolute perfect, as in 
she never knew it could feel so good kiss. Of course, two full days had passed since then, and while they hadn't kissed since that night, the relationship between her and Jake had flourished in every other way. Yesterday, they'd spent the entire day talking about childhood memories, favorite foods, and things that had scarred them for life. She learned of Jake's love for fresh fruits of all kinds and anything cooked on a grill, and that he had a strong aversion to cotton candy because a neighbor tricked him once, giving him a puff of real cotton off a nearby tree. He'd been ruined ever since. The more she learned of him, the more intrigued Meg became. The problem was, they were running out of days. This would be their last day, in fact, if neither of them spoke up. She wasn't sure why talking about what was happening between them was so difficult. It was obvious there were sparks. An undeniable connection, too. Something that made Meg want to share her deepest secrets. Share them because she knew, instinctively knew, that he cared for her. Still, there seemed to be an unspoken agreement that they'd hold off on the talk until the very last day. And now it was here. A tap came to her door, dragging Meg to awareness once more. Meg? It was Jake's voice. You up? Meg shot upright with all the grace of a jack-in-the-box, her eyes wide and worried. Yeah? W what's up? Nothing, he said. I thought since we're just about finished, I could take you out for some breakfast before we get started. A smile the size of Texas spread over her face. Really? Sure, if you'd like. I'd love that, she said. Just, uh, give me a second to freshen up. A spot of hope caused her chest to rise. The invitation somehow confirmed that Jake was on the same page. This was it, she mused the smile still at her lips, the perfect opportunity to finally talk about their relationship. Can't believe how fast this week went by. Meg couldn't contain the hint of sorrow that clung to her words. Yeah, Jake said. It cruised. She looked over the scenery as they drove on. They were close to the city now. Soon the view would shift from morning-lit fields of gold and green to quaint shopping plazas and apartment buildings. Oh, he said, pointing toward her side of the road. That's my granddad's property right there. Meg's eyes widened. You're kidding. That one with the red barn? Yep. Beyond a large lay of green stood a lovely two-story home with white siding and a gray roof. And the barn. It was nothing new or flashy, but with its weathered roof and faded paint appeal, it was picture book perfect. If you had east another three miles, you'd see my mom's house. Another mile and a half beyond that, you'd find my place. She smiled, recalling how proud her dad had been to hear that Jake owned rental property, a side-by-side -side duplex. He lived in one side, and an elderly woman lived in the other. Maybe we should swing by on the way back so I can meet your family. His answer didn't come right away, and Meg turned to look at him. She caught a flash of reluctance on his face, but it was gone before she could dwell on it. Sure, he said. That'd be nice. In the quiet moment that followed, Meg turned her attention back to her phone. At first, she wasn't really seeing it, only focusing on the way Jake had seemed anxious for her to meet his family. It had been his idea, in fact. So what had changed? When she came up empty the text on her phone shifted into focus. It was from Shayna. The two had been going back and forth since the night before. So you're really falling for this Jake guy? Meg stared at the text, feeling the truth of it in the rapid beat of her heart, the sweat that broke out over her palms. Kind of. I don't know. But I think I should stay in Montana a little longer so I can find out. Sure, she was downplaying it but she didn't want Shayna to think she'd lost her senses completely. Besides, Shayna, being fiancé to Michael's best friend Paul, was totally Team Michael, always working to convince Meg that Michael would come to his senses after the new year and propose. Trouble was, usually a step like that was preceded by some amount of exclusivity, something he'd never been willing to commit to. Shayna's reply lit up the screen. 
So what will you say to Michael? That you found some guy you're interested in, so you're going to stay? When she phrased it that way, it made Meg sound terrible. It made her feel terrible, too. But only for a moment, because Meg knew better. There was a reason she was open to the possibilities where Jake was concerned. A reason that started with M and ended in L and deserved everything that he got. Her thumbs went to work, typing back so fast she felt as if she were screaming the words. Well, Michael's never done a thing to stop me, Shay. I've given him a million chances, and he won't budge. It almost seems like he's waiting for this to happen. Like he wants me to find someone else so he can just move on and find another woman to torture for another three or five or twenty freaking years. That one hit with the punch of truth. More potent than the other. Packed with tender emotions of feeling less than enough for the man she'd cared about for so long. Her eyes stung as she looked over the words she'd sent. No matter what Shana had to say, she couldn't convince her otherwise. Whether she pursued a relationship with Jake or not, Meg wanted to end things with Michael. She wanted to end things and move back to Montana where she belonged. You okay? Jake's voice pulled Meg from her musings. Uh Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. Fine, just texting a friend of mine from... She was going to say from back home, but the phrase was all wrong. This was home. From Colorado. Michael? Whoa. Her heart cranked into double time, skipping at least two full beats. No, she blurted. Just a girlfriend of mine. She's engaged to Michael's friend. Ah. And did you break the news yet? Jake asked. What news? A smile pulled at one side of his mouth. That we plan to elope, live out the rest of our days together? The words giddy and schoolgirl shot to her head as the most happy, elated flutters romped in her chest. Oh, that news. Yep, I told her. Said she may as well tell Michael, too. Save me the trouble of sending him a text. Jake took one hand off the wheel, stretched an arm toward her, and took hold of her hand where it rested on the seat. He brought it up to his lips and pressed a kiss to the rounded curve of her knuckles. That's my girl. He lowered their hands onto the seat then, keeping them joined in one warm union. Was there a word that went beyond giddy? If so, that's what she was. Elated, overjoyed, and and thinking back on the strange reaction Jake had had when she mentioned meeting his family. A fresh flame of fear roared up in her chest, smothering the happy flutters she'd felt moments ago. She snuck a casual glance at him from the corner of her eye, noticed a furrow in his brow. It was subtle, a gentle crease along his forehead. Less subtle was the look in his eyes, a sad, almost pained look. Meg moved her gaze back to the view beyond her window, wondering if she'd misjudged his expression. After all, it had been such a limited view of him. Still, the question loomed over her head like a black, heavy cloud. What if Jake didn't want a commitment either? A new bit of desperation seeped in, urging her to bring up the conversation, test the relationship waters. She thought about how to phrase it, something like, I've been thinking about moving back. That was simple enough. She'd do it. She'd say it. In just a minute. Only her mouth wouldn't work. Perhaps it was because her mind was already working overtime. Cycling through all the moments she'd spent with Jake during the last week. Were they enough to justify such a move? Such a change in her life? Meg had confided in her father the day after they'd kissed told him about the feeling she had for Jake. He hadn't seemed the least bit surprised. Meg could tell, however, that he was playing the keep-it-cool card. He didn't want to show the relief he felt about his daughter giving up on a guy he'd said was no good from the start. The truck came to a slow, and Meg glanced up. They were pulling up to the diner already. How long had she been silent? A quick glance at her phone said Shana hadn't texted her back. Who could blame her after that rant? Stay there, Jake said, before climbing out of the truck. He walked around the front before opening her door. 
When their eyes met, he scrutinized her for a blink. You doing all right? She nodded. Yeah, I'm good. Just distracted, sorry. The provocative look that took over his face remedied that in a heartbeat. It seemed to say she'd misread his expression moments ago, that she'd misread his reaction to her suggestion about meeting his family as well. It's okay, he said. Just promise that I'll be the center of your thoughts from this point on and I'm good. Meg chuckled, musing she might just be able to make good on that. She ran a finger over her chest in a crisscross motion, a coy smile spreading over her face. Promise. His gaze met hers, and a dose of liquid fire burst right through her chest. Good, he said. Now let's go get some breakfast. Chapter 9 Are you here with Jake Billens? Meg reached for the paper towels, began drying her hands as she eyed a woman through the restroom mirror. Tall, blonde, and paper doll thin. Um, yeah, I am. Meg spun around wondering just what the woman had on her mind. Sorry to bother you, she said, folding her long arms across her chest. She popped out a hip and leaned on one stiletto heel. I just wanted to know how you like it. There was a challenge in her eyes, one that planted instant seeds of fear in Meg's heart where Jake was concerned. She blew out a shallow breath. How do I like what? Being one of Jake's flavors in the month. He stayed with me a little longer than that, but the girl before me didn't get more than a week. One after me had less than that. She shoved a hand into her pink sparkly purse and pulled out a gold tube of lipstick. With slow, precise steps, the woman clanked over to the mirror and applied it. So, she said while spreading on a second coat. She smacked her lips, blotted them with a paper towel, and disposed it in the trash. Her eyes fell back on Meg. Is it worth being with him for the short amount of time, knowing that you'll be getting the boot any day? Or are you hoping to be the one girl he actually falls in love with? Panic tightened Meg's throat. It pounded in her head. Numb, muted thumps buried beneath the woman's words. She cleared her throat. Thanks for the warning, she managed. But I know where I stand with Jake, and to be frank, it really doesn't concern you. The woman's bottom lip puckered slightly, the look of disgust scrunching her face. Well, she snapped. Good luck, Van. She strutted out of the restroom, leaving an even bigger presence in her wake. Doubt. The pounding in Meg's head cranked up a notch. She closed her eyes, exhaled a jagged breath, and wondered if she should make for the stalls once more. Forget the appetite she'd had only moments ago. She was about to be sick. Flavor of the month? Was it possible that Jake was a player? Could her luck really be so bad? Nearly three years spent with Michael, a non-committal type who's as promising as the dead end on Ritter Drive. And now... Once she falls for a guy, she's positive as Michael's total opposite. Meg hears he's dating and dumping girls left and right. Please say she's lying. Please, please, please. After the inward chant, Meg swung open the heavy door. Jake stood facing the window in the foyer, hands tucked into his pockets, his cowboy hat on his head. Once he started to shift a lazy turn in her direction, Meg could nearly hear the snaps and clicks of the paparazzi. The image was front cover worthy without a doubt. No wonder, she thought. No wonder the man went through so many women. He probably had girls throwing themselves at his feet. He flashed her a smile as their eyes met. They have the booth ready for us. Meg looked down at the hand he offered, recalling how much she liked the feel of that hand in hers. Beyond that, she liked the feel of him in her life. So how had this no-doubt jealous woman stepped in and unraveled her with the pull of one tiny thread? Was Meg that fragile? She offered Jake a slight nod while accepting his hand. They followed the hostess through the bustling diner. If the woman from the restroom was seated at one of those tables, Meg didn't want to know it. There was a level of shame attached to her current company now, though Meg wasn't sure there should be. She just hadn't had a chance to sift through the chaos in her mind. The noise of that voice and those words spinning through her lowered head. Ketchup bottles and hot sauce stood at each table next to sugar packets and jellies. Jake and the hostess stopped before an empty booth and the menus were dropped to the table. 
Meg sunk onto the vinyl seat and slid until she sat in the center. Sure is a beautiful day out there, Jake said, settling in across from her. Meg glanced out the window, pressing a hand against her middle as if it might keep her in one piece. Yeah. Her gaze wandered around the diner, a half-hearted attempt to see if the woman was nearby. At least if she were, it would be a good lead-in to confront Jake about what she'd heard. When she came up empty, Meg felt relieved, and then disappointed. she just heard something that she hoped very badly wasn't true. How on earth would she work up the nerve to... Did you see that woman come out of the bathroom before me? Meg expected Jake's face to show the surprise she felt from her own question. It didn't. No, he said. What woman? She grabbed one of the sugar packets by the jams and tore at the edge. Tall, blonde, skinny. Her eyes drifted from the packet to Jake. Pink, sparkly, pursed. She said she knows you? She did. His brow lifted. Huh. No, I didn't see anyone I know come out of there besides you. Her gaze fell back to the sugar as she poured a small heap into her palm. There'd been no point in opening the packet. Meg didn't have any place to put it. No tea or coffee before her. None even ordered yet. Still, she'd ripped open the packet and poured it onto her hand and... and done just what she'd done in her relationship with Michael. Dumped everything she had into a place where it wouldn't do her any good. She'd been certain that Jake was different. His reaction to hearing how Michael would commit said it all, didn't it? Yes, she decided. It said everything. So that's it? he asked. She said she knew me, nothing more. It felt as if a bomb had gone off in her chest, an explosion of mean racing heat. Uh, yeah. I mean, no. She said something else. She attempted to pour the sugar back into the packet, frowning as it spilled. It was weird, Meg said. She just asked if I was with you. Said something about, well, I guess she went out with you at some point. She went on to imply that you were, uh, womanizer, I guess. Huh. Jake's gaze was set on the mess she was making with the scattered sugar crystals. And what did you say? Meg propped the open sugar packet against the napkin holder and wiped the remaining granules off the table. Nothing. She turned her face away from him and imagined learning that all of it was true. Imagine hearing him admit to going through women faster than Meg went through blank pages on a bad art day. Her fear kicked up tenfold. It wasn't silly for her to feel afraid, she told herself. Not at all. Because she had a lot to lose. Jake had given her something over the last few days given her something that Michael had failed to give her in three years' time. He made her feel valued, cherished, good enough. He would made her feel worthy of a commitment, worthy of his commitment. She chanced losing that if she pushed. Even if it was an illusion, even if Jake went around making every woman feel this way, she still wasn't willing to let it go. Not yet. Breakfast in the diner was ruined. The ride home was even worse. All Meg could do was think about losing Michael and Jake, of starting over altogether. Of course she did her best to stay on top of what little conversation took place, but she knew better than to think she was fooling Jake. What difference did it make? He was probably just glad to be off the hook. It had to be why he didn't want to introduce her to his family. He probably never introduced women to his family. Sure, he'd mention it on occasion, make the woman think she was important enough, but in the end, he had no intention of following through. He would be leaving tomorrow morning anyway, or would he leave tonight? No matter either way. Meg had her mind made up to move back to Montana. She was grateful for that, but who she'd spend that time with remained to be seen. Chapter 10 Somber energy stifled the kitchen air, making it hard for Jake to breathe. He'd been planning to have a serious talk with Meg that day, planned on telling her just how much he cared for her, telling her about his short-lived run as a playboy and his dedication to steer clear of that activity for the last year. Seems like a girl from his past beat him to the punch. By the physical description Meg gave, Jake figured it was Carrie. 
He hadn't done right by that woman, and figured she was smearing his name through the mud all she could. He knocked his knuckles on the counter, shaking his head in frustration. Meg had clammed up after the incident, ignored him while finishing the last few batches, and then insisted she go out back and check for Miss Grapes while he stayed in the kitchen tending to the processor. Like there was anything to it. Stand there, wait for the steam to reduce the grapes to juice. Nearly an hour of standing and pacing and going crazy in his own head. They had only two batches left. Two batches, and she insisted on separating. Damn it, he grumbled, under his breath. He couldn't let this woman go. He was crazy about her. About the snarky way she spoke back to him. The way she studied the beauty of simple everyday items. The way she felt in his arms. A quick lift of the lid told Jake they had another twenty minutes to go before bottling the juice. Now might be a good time to go on back there. Insist that she stop picking for a minute and talk. Talk about his past. About their future. She hadn't exactly come out and said she was done with Michael. But she'd nearly said as much with her behavior. Any outsider watching Jake and Meg the last few days would guess they were an item. And that suited him just fine. With the exhale of a deep breath, Jake looked out the window. There she was, hunched beneath a patch of leaves, the empty-looking basket by her side. A laugh bubbled up in his throat. They'd already picked all the grapes, done a thorough job of it, too. She wasn't going to find anything. He tapped on the window with the exhale of a nervous breath. Meg spun around and glared at him through the glass. Jake smiled, half nervous, half entertained, and cracked the thing open a few inches. You getting anything? A small laugh coated the last word. Yep, she hollered, without delay. Let me see. He covered another smile as Meg lifted a single cluster, a small one at that, high in the air for him to see. Another chuckle. That's it? Meg dropped the cluster back into her basket without another word. Hmm, that hadn't gone too well. Okay, it was time to stop putting this off. He'd go out there, sit down with her, and say everything he needed to say. With his mind made up, he rounded the counter and stepped toward the sliding glass door. He had a solid grip on the handle when the loud chime of the doorbell filled the house. An eerie echo hummed in his ears like an ominous pulsing beat. In all the days he'd been there, the only person to ring that bell had been the delivery guy Jake sent for. Should he answer it himself, or call for Meg? Meg, he decided, definitely. He slid open the sliding glass door. Someone's at the door, he called. Meg didn't budge. Kept her head beneath the foliage. Who is it? I don't know. Didn't you answer it? He huffed out a breath. No, do you want me to? Meg made a scene of coming to a stand, adjusting her clothes dramatically as she stomped toward the sliding door. I guess I'll get it. She kept her head high as she walked past, glancing at him for the slightest of seconds. Jake gave her a grin, one she almost returned. The bell rang again. A knock followed. I'm surprised they haven't left yet, Meg grumbled. Jake followed her into the front room, watched as she opened the heavy oak door, and squinted his eyes as he took in the sight at the other side of the screen. A sharp knot sunk deep into his gut. Meg gasped, took a step back, and spoke the one word Jake least wanted to hear on her lips. Michael. Chapter 11 How in the... What in the... What are you doing here? Meg asked. It hurt to look at him. Why did it hurt to look at him? Michael's eyes looked red and swollen. Can I come in? Sure. She pushed open the door and held it with her arm. Michael stepped inside, his presence bringing a strange new energy into the room. Did you want to have a seat, or... The sentence dropped as Meg realized who Michael was staring at. Her eyes trailed a slow and timid path toward the other man in the room the one who stood no more than three feet from her. Jake. His arms were crossed, his broad shoulders tight, and his posture squared straight toward the door. There was a challenge written in the dark glare in his eyes. 
one that lit a small fire in Meg's tummy. This is Jake, she managed, through a shaky breath. When Jake's arms didn't budge or loosen to shake hands, Meg glanced back at Michael. She cleared her throat. A and Jake, this is Michael. The two settled for head nods, and then their attention was set back on her. Can I talk to you alone someplace? Michael asked. Maybe out here on the porch? His eyes darted to Jake before settling back on her. It took nearly everything she had in her, but Meg did not look back to Jake. Sure, she said. Out the front they went. The sun had started its slow descent toward the horizon, but Meg couldn't get herself to even look for the sunset. Something was happening inside of her. Something she couldn't describe. A celebration, maybe? A bit of triumph, too? Michael had come clear out here for her. She mattered that much to him. That was satisfying. So satisfying. She wanted to smile or squeal or, or throw up. Do you want to sit? She asked. Michael shook his head and glared toward the house. Let's walk. Okay. She stuffed her hands into the pockets of her jacket as she took the stairs, unwilling to hold his hand. She didn't appreciate the curt tone he took with her, the entitlement in his face and words and voice. He was entitled to nothing, as per his own stupid preference to remain unattached, and she'd make sure he knew it. She started up with a fast pace once they hit the sidewalk, a sidewalk she hadn't trailed in years. Well? He stopped walking at her prompt, but Meg continued. That's all you have to say? He asked, gaining speed to catch up with her once more. I'm still waiting to hear what you have to say. I assume Shayna told you about Jake? Why did she like the sound of his name so much? He was most likely just as much of a dead end as Michael was. Yeah, she did. And you know what my first thought was? This time Meg stopped walking and spun to face him. What? She looked at him, really looked, as the familiar connection between them linked together once more. The pull of three years spent giving and taking and building something that mattered. It mattered, she assured herself. My first thought was... He ran a hand over the back of his neck. It was... I'm such an idiot. Satisfaction the deep and thorough kind she'd longed for all these months and days and years, settled over her. First over her skin, creating a ripple of goosebumps up her arms, and then into her heart, kindling the warmth she still torched for him. I've been a fool to string you along the way I have, he continued. I don't know why I was dragging my feet so much. I was scared, I'll admit it. But this... Having you spend time with some cowboy from your hometown, hearing that you have feelings for one another, that scares me a whole lot more than committing ever has. The comment rubbed Meg wrong. Her head tilted. The warm feeling cooled. The goosebumps on her skin disappeared. She folded her arms. Huh? He looked scared all right. Like a scared little boy trying to get out of trouble just a little too late. I want you to come back to Denver with me, he said. Meg leaned on one hip, lips closed, eyes locked on him. And then we can talk about our future. We don't need to make definite plans or anything, but I do know one thing for sure. I definitely don't want you to date anybody else, not ever again. He stepped closer to her, slid his hand along her jaw, and looked at her with penitent eyes. I'm sorry for being so stupid. Jake could not believe his eyes. Was she really falling for that stuffy jerk and his load of bullcrap? Could the guy really win her back so easily? He stepped away from the window, wishing the vision of Meg and the idiot touching her would disappear as quickly as the actual view of them. But it stayed in his head, even through the new view before him. The carpet in the front room, the tiled floor in the kitchen, the stove, processor, and the steam rising from it as he lifted the lid. Grapes are ready, he realized. Jake propped the bottles numbly, 
positioning the oven rack as visions of Michael's hand on Meg's face burned at his insides. He couldn't let that guy just step in and steal her away, could he? The words, steal her away, seemed to bite back. He was the one who'd stolen the girl, wasn't he? She'd been with this guy for years now, had told Jake about him from the beginning. But told him what? That she was with a guy who was too much of a fool to make her his? The guy deserved to lose her, as far as Jake was concerned. Mind if I take over for you? The voice of Thomas Bolton took Jake by surprise. He glanced toward the mudroom, realizing he must have come through the back door. Thomas cleared his throat as he walked through the dining area. I just, uh, figured I'd bottle up the last few quarts, he explained. Thinking of Meg's mother the way that I am, probably do me some good. Bit of healing, as they say. Jake gave him a nod. Sounds like a good idea. Thomas caught his gaze once more, angling his head to give him a knowing look. That means you can go find Meg. Oh, I don't, I don't want to bother. Go on, he said sternly. She's just down the street. I'll finish up here. He began removing his suit coat. Hurry now. I don't want her with that Colorado kid any more than you do. Realization struck. He had her father's approval. A warm dose of appreciation washed over him, filling him with new determination. At once he gave Thomas a nod and bolted for the door. The view from the porch was similar to the one he'd seen moments ago. Only this time, they were walking toward the house instead of away from it, lit by the sun on the sidewalk. Michael reached a long arm behind Meg and pulled her against his side as they moved. Meg tipped her head toward him, walking willingly by his side. Slow strides. Words at their lips that Jake couldn't hear. Words he didn't want to hear. A mean blade of heat pierced his chest, the contents seeming to pool around his ribs like lava. His throat tightened along with his fists. Perhaps the guy had finally come to his senses. What if he'd proposed down the block? Were the pair on their way back ready to announce the news to her dad? Jake's heart sputtered and clanked. He couldn't wait around for that. Couldn't handle hearing that kind of news. Thomas had freed Jake from the chore in the kitchen, but he couldn't use that freedom in the way the man intended. Not after seeing her cuddled up to Michael. And not after the day he and Meg had had. The two had barely spoken since breakfast, since the woman from Jake's past had soiled his name, planted doubts in Meg about his character. Hell, she was probably happy to run back into Colorado Guy's arms. With roaring flames in his chest, the thundering pound in his heart, Jake sunk a hand into his pocket, fished out his keys, and made for the truck. By the grace of God, he'd parked along the street instead of the driveway. At least he'd be able to sneak away without making a spectacle of himself. He walked faster as he neared the truck, anxious to get away from the scene. Chances were, Meg was too caught up in the moment to notice. Jake roared up the truck, sunk the pedal to drive away. He wasn't exactly sure what he was leaving behind. A woman who was better off without him? Or a woman who just re-entered the trap of her past? Whichever the case... One thing was certain. Jake was leaving behind a woman he was meant to love. And he wasn't sure he'd ever recover. Chapter 12 Wonder where he's going in such a huff, Michael said, speaking Meg's thoughts aloud. Meg broke free from the arm he had around her back and stopped walking, a sick knot twisting in her gut. This didn't look good. If Jake had seen the two of them walking together, he would have definitely gotten the wrong idea. He couldn't have known that only two minutes ago Meg had broken things off with Michael, told him she'd be staying in Montana, whether she ended up with the cowboy, as he called him, or not. She'd simply been saying goodbye to the man she'd spent the last few years of her life with, saying goodbye to the friendship and all it meant to her. But Jake couldn't have known that. She'd seen emergency flares burst into flame, recalled the time her father lit one when the car broke down on the freeway one night, it felt as if that very flare had struck its fiery flame right inside her chest. It was screaming for help, calling for action, but there was none to take. She told herself that very thing as she sent Michael back to the airport, 
back to his life in Colorado. There was nothing she could do. She didn't have Jake's cell phone number to reach him, hadn't needed it, seeing that the two had spent every waking moment together the last week. The sunset came and went quickly. Meg rested quietly in the chair by the front room window waiting. She held a book in her hands, Art and Fear, a book she'd read nearly a hundred times, a book she adored like a cherished friend. And though she wasn't reading it right then, distracted as she was, the well-worn paperback offered comfort. Time to hit the sheets, young lady. Dad's voice came from the dark entry of the hallway. I'm sure he'll be back tomorrow to get his things. To get his things? Was that all he needed to do? Quiet footsteps shuffled into the room. Well, Maggie, he most likely thinks you've left to be with Michael. But when he comes back, you can set him straight. Meg nodded, bit at her lower lip, and wiped the silent tears that streamed down her cheeks. If it makes you feel any better, I called over to Barnhart's place, asked if he'd shown up. Billy said he'd come by to get a few things and was headed back home to the best of his knowledge. She turned toward her dad, eyeing him through the shadows. You did? You called? Mm Mm-hmm. When? He chuckled under his breath. Uh, About ten minutes ago. Meg gasped. Dad, what time is it? Not quite midnight. A hint of shame coated the words. Hell, I've come to care for him, too. You know? He's a good man, that one. Barnhart's can't say enough about him. She nodded. Yeah, he is. A moment ticked by as Meg dared herself to share something she hadn't yet. We got in kind of a fight today. Her dad made his way over to the couch, lowering himself as he spoke. Did you now? It was stupid, really. Meg explained how things had gone. The girl in the restroom, the half-hearted way Meg had confronted him, and the hesitant way he'd replied. I was kind of freaking out by the time we got home, realizing that, in some ways... Jake and I have grown closer in one week than Michael and I have in the entire time I've known him. She laughed, shrugged, then wiped at more tears as they came. The truth of her own words touching tender places in her heart. I pretty much ignored him the rest of the day, and then Michael showed up, and now he's gone. I see, her father said. You'd had a bit of a rift between you then. Yeah, He came to a stand, resting a hand on hers. What's that saying your mom used to quote? Something like, some things don't work out because greater things are in the works. He nodded. Think that's how she said it anyhow. It's true. And I think in this case, Jake's the greater thing that came along. Meg glanced up, caught a grin from him in the moonlight seeping through the blinds. Most likely... Whatever it is this gal was razzing you about in the ladies' room was probably nothing to worry over at all. You'll get your chance to talk with him about it soon enough. I hope so. She couldn't help but feel that her father was right. Jake just didn't seem the womanizing type. She only wished she could rewind time, get all of her doubts out of the way and enjoy the day with him, their last day together. That flame flared up in her chest once more. No, no. Don't think like that. He'll be back. He'll be back. Whoa, Jake mumbled as he approached the down post. Right here, Dodger, right here. A bright beam of morning sun shone on his back as he climbed off his horse and reached for the saddlebag. It had been a long time since he'd done ranch work on Sunday, but he'd be lying if he said it wasn't doing him some good. With the proper tools in hand, he approached the post, eyeing a tall weed that stood nearby. Spots of moisture clung to the green leaves, the dots ranging from large to microscopic, like Meg's painting of the plate. That familiar, biting pain roared up in his middle again, seeming to hollow out his insides, one vicious bite after the next. How she'd left such a hole in him was beyond comprehension. He'd barely had a week with Meg Bolton, yet she'd managed to own nearly every thought he had. Every desire, too. All to have it snatched away by some miserable ever-after man from her past. The guy was a card, and Jake knew it. So why hadn't he stood up to fight for the woman he cared for? Because she'd stopped caring for him. He'd seen the light in her shut off in the diner. The way she turned from hot to cold. 
Meg didn't want some womanizing cowboy she'd barely met. She wanted the man she'd invested all that time into. The one who'd hopped a plane, showed up at her door and begged her to come back to him. And though Jake hadn't gone back to the house since, he knew that's just what she'd done. The couple had probably announced their engagement, flown back to Colorado, and began making preparations for a spring wedding. He sunk the spade of his shovel into the damp ground, grateful for the pre-dawn storm that had moistened the soil. Yet as he dug up the broken post, anxious to replace it with a new one, Jake couldn't help but think of how badly he'd like to fix things with Meg. He'd been working up to a serious conversation all week long. A conversation about his past. Mistakes that he'd made. And another one about her future, and how he hoped to be a part of it. He never had gotten a chance to talk about those things. The diner incident, turning it all sour as it did. Then in walked Jackass, king of the stupids come to reclaim his prize. Is that really all it took? Hop on some airplane, show up at her door, and wham, she's yours again? Yours again? He flung a mound of soil away from the post and sunk the shovel once more. The idea wasn't half bad. It'd work for Michael, hadn't it? Was it possible it could work for him, too? Jake moved at a heated pace the idea sinking into him like roots from a massive oak, strong and deep and certain. He needed to go and get her back. He had to. Who was king of the stupids now? He was, if he let Meg go so easily. The desperation that took over was unbearable. He needed to find out where Meg's apartment was, catch the first flight out, and win that woman back. Without a second thought, Jake stuffed his tools back into the bag and climbed down to the saddle. Within minutes, he was steering Dodger toward the main road. He'd head to the Boltons first thing, get the address to Meg's apartment, and take it from there. It was Sunday, after all. Her father should be home. He recalled what the man had said to him the other night when Michael had returned. Something about not wanting Meg to be with him any more than he did. Yes, Thomas would definitely help. He was the one to encourage him that very evening. Jake only hoped he'd forgive him for chickening out the first time around. Dodger's hooves thundered like the pounding of Jake's heart as they made their way. There would be no chickening out today. This time, he would be the one to bring the girl home. For good. Chapter 13 Meg tugged open the dryer, embracing the heat that seeped over her arms as she reached inside. With slow, drawn-out movements, she pulled out the first item. A white t-shirt, made even brighter by the late morning sun streaming through the window. While sitting on the floor, she spread the shirt over her crossed legs and smoothed out the creases. A recollection of Jake's broad chest came to mind as she did, along with the memory of his beating heart beneath her palm. The beat of her own heart increased at the thought, her face and neck warming too. While matching the sleeves up, she imagined Jake's strong arms the way they'd felt around her body while he held her, and those hands, solid hands that had worked a spell over her as they tightened around her hips. With a deep sigh, she dropped the folded tee into the basket and reached for the next article of clothing, a button-up flannel that she recognized with ease. He'd been wearing it the day he arrived. She brought it to her nose and inhaled a deep breath, imagining the first moment she'd caught scent of his cologne, the uncontrollable things it did to her. Perhaps it was just her imagination, but she swore hints of that scent still clung to the fabric. Meg began to lay the shirt on her lap, but stopped herself in the action. She shrugged into it instead, enjoying the feel of his arms around her once more, basking in the warmth it brought. Was she foolish to be longing for him in such a way? What if Jake had duped both Meg and her father? What if he were some lousy woman-chasing man who'd already moved on to his next catch? Then she'd fantasize about the idea of him, and look for the man she thought he was until she found him. Her spirits lifted at the thought. She wouldn't simply give up on love. She wouldn't stop looking for the right one the one who offered everything Jake appeared to have. The steady clumps of a galloping horse pulled Meg from her musings. 
She glanced up at the window, tilting her head to better listen, and felt her eyes widen with hope. A foolish hope, maybe, but it was still there all the same. She rushed to the sliding glass door, searched the road beyond the backyard, and came up empty. Through the kitchen she went, ready to peek through the window when she realized the sound had stopped. Her shoulders dropped, her hopes dying with the action. She spun to face the front room, releasing a defeated sigh. Wait, the front door was open. Wide open. Leaving a clear view through the screen door. A view that revealed a very welcome sight. Meg's heart jumped as her eyes settled on him. Tall in height, broad in the shoulders, and more handsome than ever. Jake Billings stood on her porch. He tipped his hat and gave her a nod. Howdy. It was that deep masculinity she had come to love. Meg made her way to the door, went to open it, and got stuck working the stubborn handle. A rash of warmth spread over her cheeks. Sorry, she said. This stupid thing doesn't... Doesn't like you, Jake said, finishing for her. But I do. He reached out, twisted the handle, and pulled open the door. His eyes locked on hers. You're here. Meg nodded, moving out of the way as he stepped inside. He glanced down at the shirt she wore, and Meg folded her arms, embarrassed that he'd caught her in his shirt. His brows furrowed. I didn't think you'd be here. She tilted her head, wondering why he would have come if he hadn't expected her to be there. His clothes. That's what he'd come for. The heat from her cheeks spread until her whole face felt hot. You must be here to get your things. She spun around and headed to the laundry room as she continued. Your clothes just came out of the dryer and... That's not what I'm here for, he said. Meg stopped walking, listening as his boots stepped over the tile until he caught up with her. She felt the warmth of him against her back as he stepped up behind her, smelled the spicy scent of his cologne, and watched as his strong, solid hands slid down her forearms. Once they were at her wrists, Jake pulled his arms around her, bringing hers along with them in a warm embrace. His mouth grazed the edge of her earlobe. I don't want to lose you, Meg. I freaked out when you spoke to that woman at the diner. Worried that you might find out about my past before I had a chance to talk with you about it. And before I could gather my thoughts, your guy shows up and whisks you away. Jake, let me finish. Oh, she'd let him finish, all right. But already her heart was going wild with hope and elation and every uncontrollable thing she'd tried to prevent since he left. I had a breakup with the first gal I lost my heart to. She dumped me for a guy who left one broken heart after the next in his wake. I told myself if that's what women wanted, then that's what they were going to get. He spun her around, set his hands on her shoulders. I've since changed my ways and haven't looked back. You have to believe me when I say that what I feel for you, it's something I've never felt before. Not even for the girl I first loved, or thought I loved anyway. Now you gave Michael a couple years to set things right with you. I'm just asking for a few more days. Give it some time between us, Meg, before you run off and marry him. Marry him? You might end up wanting to marry me instead. A mass of flurries took flight in her chest, swirled around her heart in a breathless spin. I told Michael to go home, she said. Jake tilted his head. When? Meg glanced down as his hands cradled hers. When he came, she said, looking back to him. I told him he was too late, that he should go home without me because I was where I belonged. A smile spread over his handsome face. You did? You told him that? She nodded, returning his grin with one of her own. What about your things, your apartment? What will you do about all that? My dad spoke to an agent out there. He found someone who's interested in finishing out the lease. All I need to do is go back and get my stuff. 
Jake's hands moved to her hips a moment before he rushed in for a kiss that took her breath away. Every ounce of passion she thought she'd felt in that first kiss was back, surging through her body in a heated flow. Meg gave in to the moment, more affected by his kiss than before. Once the pace died down, his kisses reducing to slower, sweeter endeavors, Jake brought his hands to her face. I know someone who could take you back there to get your things, he said. Meg pressed another lingering kiss to his lips. You do? If this was a game of tag and Jake was it, he made sure to correct that by planting an intoxicating kiss just below her earlobe. Yes, he murmured against her skin. He rides horses, is good in the kitchen, and will cost about $500 a week. Meg giggled as he pressed more kisses to the tender place. She lifted her chin to look at him, warmed by that playful spark in his eyes. Five hundred dollars, huh? Well then, sold to the young Miss Bolton. Epilogue That's a damn fine-looking pair of boots right there, I'll tell you that much. Meg giggled, the action causing her paintbrush to bounce. She pulled it away from the canvas until she got control of herself. You're right, she said, it is. She could hear Jake pacing behind her, nearly see the peacock set of his proud shoulders. I think this is going to be your next bestseller, he continued. She pulled back from the canvas once more, chuckling as she dipped into a blend of burnt umber and titanium white. With renewed focus, she worked at the highlights where the sun reflected off the copper tip of his boot. She'd been admiring the pair for months now, knowing they'd make a fine addition to her country art collection. They'd seen their share of days out in the land, and it showed in each scuff, crease, and crack in the worn leather. I'll be sure to name you as my inspiration when it becomes famous. Jake moved in closer, his large hands wrapping around the sides of her waist from behind. His mouth skimmed the ridge of her ear. That sounds like a deal to me. He proceeded to slip her hair off her neck at one side before coming in once more. Meg remained very still while his mouth moved over the curve of her neck in a slow, heated tease. His lips parted, and his breath tickled the delicate skin by her earlobe. Jake made a groaning sound as he sunk his teeth into her flesh the slightest bit, the action pulling a similar sound from Meg's throat. Hey she mumbled. No fair. I'm trying to work here. He planted a series of kisses to the area. I know, he murmured. And I'm getting ignored. We're supposed to go riding, aren't we? Mm-hmm. Only it sounded more like the longing sound of a moan. Meg shrunk her head into her shoulders as his tongue slid along her collarbone. We'll go, she managed. I'm almost done. Of course, with this kind of attention, the wait might be longer than I thought. Fine, he whispered. I like watching you work anyway. He walked over to where Bear rested on his floor mat. His large paws sprawled out before him. So does Bear, he added while sinking onto the floor beside him. In fact, he told me the other day that once you move in, you should do painting a hymn. Meg angled her brush, adding one finishing touch to the painting as Jake's comment registered. He told you that, huh? You want to be next, Bear? The large dog lifted his head off his paws half an inch and rested it back down. He also said we should move the wedding up. Meg hit a grin. He did, did he? Yep. Said we should get married in May instead of July. Tell him it rains too much in May. Meg said with a laugh. Oh, you know what? Jake shot to his feet and headed into the other room. I forgot about something, he hollered from the hall, a new energy coating his words. When he came back, he was hiding something against his chest. What is it? Did you know that in your basement, in the room where I stayed, there was this big box of photos? Her eyes widened. The ones from my childhood? Yes, yeah, she knew. Stacks of unflattering photos capturing all of her awkward years. 
You didn't go through those, did you? Jake threw her a look. Only every time I got a chance. I came past one photo in particular, though. It stuck out to me. And I thought you might want to take a look at it. He peeled his palms away from his chest and turned the image so it faced her. Meg gasped, throwing a hand to her mouth. That was in there? Jake gulped, a hint of emotion flashing in his eyes. She reached out as he handed over the photo, absorbing the image with eager eyes. It was of her, when she was 14 years old, painting the live portrait of her mother. Tears streamed down her cheeks as she realized what this meant. I can repaint her now, she said. I can't believe you found this. There are like thousands of pictures in that thing, I swear. He chuckled. I knew that I drew her alive, but I never considered that my dad might have taken a picture of us while I did it. I just never thought. She climbed off the bar stool and threw her arms around Jake in a tight embrace. With her face nestled against his shoulder, she spoke up once more. Thank you for this. It means the world to me. She pulled back, wiping the tears from her face as a thought came to mind. And you know what? Jake kept a firm hold on her, his strong arms wrapped behind her back. My dad's birthday is coming up. I can gift it to him then. The idea was so perfect Meg wanted to hit fast forward to the moment itself, knowing the joy it would bring to him. You don't think Celia would mind, do you? Jake shook his head. No, she wouldn't mind that at all. She mused on the happiness Celia Winstrom and her father had found since Meg moved back home. She wouldn't be surprised if the two of them announced wedding plans of their own soon. Just one more thing to look forward to, she thought. Jake nuzzled into her neck, began pressing kisses along the tender slope. I can't wait until you're mine. All mine. Meg giggled, the sensation raising goosebumps over her skin. He trailed his way up to her lips, kissed her long and hard, before mumbling against them. I love you, Meg. I love you so much. She grinned and kissed him again. I love you too, she assured, reflecting on the positive shifts in her life. Colorado had definitely been a lovely place one that held a special spot in her past. But now, with her auctioned ranch hand by her side, Meg finally had someone who considered their future. And with Jake Billings in her life, oh, what a future it would be. Acknowledgements. Thank you so much, dear family, for your continued support and encouragement. And thank you, beautiful beta readers, for your speedy reads and feedback. Donna Nolan, Thanks for sharing your gift for editing. Rocky Palmer, thank you for lending your editing skills as well. How grateful I am for each of you. Other acknowledgments. Book mentioned, Art and Fear. Observations on the Perils and Rewards of Art Making was written by David Bales and Ted Orland. This has been Ranch Hand for Auction. Written by Kimberly Cray. Narrated by Morgana Morningside. Copyright 2016 by Kimberly Cray. Production copyright by Kimberly Cray.